Okay, I guess uh, some more participants will uh, will join afterwards. So welcome everybody. Um, we reached day four of the IADF school. Uh, this morning uh, we have uh, Professor Giuseppe Scarpa and uh, engineer uh, Matteo Ciotola um, that uh, will uh, give a lecture about image uh, fusion. Uh, specifically, Professor Scappa will start with uh, pass sharpening by convolutional neural networks. Um, let me give you just a brief, um, brief introduction for uh, Professor Scappa. Uh, he's an associate professor at the University of Naples, Federico II. Um, professor Scappa has experience as a postdoc in uh, uh, very famous research centers at the, as the UTIA in Prague or the INRIA in France at Sofia Antipoli. Um, his expertise is all um, about uh, image segmentation, classification, um, object detection, specifically also a lot of experience in pass sharpening. Uh, there are some very famous publications from him and his research group. Um, and then uh, his research interests also include data fusion, service speckling, um, and uh, in the last years, deep learning based uh, methodologies for data fusion. Um, Matteo Ciotola is uh, a PhD candidate uh, doing his PhD on deep learning based data fusion, super resolution and path sharpening. Um, the lecture is so split that uh, Professor Giuseppe Scarpa will uh, uh, give a lecture about this topic uh, for the first two hours, and then the second two hours will be dedicated to exercise and tutorials. Um, just before starting, again, a, a small a recommendation to everybody, just write your question in the chat. You are free to raise your hand and then it's up to the professor to decide uh, when is the right moment to answer the, the question. He can interrupt the lecture to answer or collect all the answer together and then um, open a question answer um, session at the end of the lecture. Uh, please, for the professor, just read out loud the, um, the, the, the questions that are in the chat so the people that are following the live stream can, uh, can also uh, understand which is the question to be answered. Okay, then, Pepe, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone, um, and thanks a lot, uh, Paolo, for this kind introduction. Uh, before starting, uh, let me thank the organizers for their kind invitation to the school, and I'm really honored to speak here today. Um, I would also like to thank all of you for attending this class, hoping that uh, you will appreciate it. Uh, besides, I'm also happy to share this opportunity with Dr. Matteo Ciotola, with which I've been working on pan sharpening in the last few years, and I would like to thank uh, for his participation. Uh, this class um, falls in the frame of deep learning-based image fusion uh, in the remote sensing context. Uh, in particular, uh, to be more concrete, uh, we will focus on a specific task which is pan sharpening, one of the most classical fusion tasks in remote sensing. However, many considerations that will be made here uh, are of general interest uh, in the image fusion uh, framework. Um, okay. Uh, before starting, let me provide a few details. Uh, Paolo already uh, announced this organization, but uh, well, um, I will carry out the, the, the first part of this cl uh, class, a couple of hours, concentrating on uh, theoretical aspects. And then I will leave the desk to Matteo for the hands-on session that will take place in the, in the second half. Uh, for the hands-on session, we will leverage on the Kaggle Cloud Computing Service. Uh, on it, a uh, data set has, uh, and some demo scripts have been already set up and will be shared during the, the lab session. Uh, this said, I would invite those of you that have not yet registered on Kaggle to do it as soon as possible, maybe uh, during the breaks uh, when Matteo will be available for uh, eventual uh, support. We can now give a look uh, to the content of this class after a short introduction to the problem with related challenges. 
uh, we will review traditional solutions. Uh, then we will give a look to the quality assessment problem, and uh, this is, uh, as this is uh, intimately related with the choice of a loss for training, uh, whatever deep learning model uh, we decide to use. Uh, next, we will move to the data set preparation and training options before seeing the most popular uh, convolutional neural networks uh, for punch happening uh, that are mostly based on supervised training. Uh, then we will conclude with a look to the latest solutions that uh, resort to full resolution and supervised training. Uh, let's start with the problem statement uh, with the help of a graphical description of what is punch sharpening. To co-register the images of, of a given area, uh, the single band panchromatic image and a lower resolution but multi-band or multispectral image are combined to get a richer product uh, which retains the spatial resolution of the pan component while keeping the multispectral characteristics of the multispectral component. Uh, said in different words, uh, pan sharpening can be thought as a, a super resolution of the multispectral input component supported by a spatial guide represented by the pan component. Uh, the ratio uh, bet uh, between the resolutions of the MS and of the PAN components, uh, you can call it R, uh, is usually equal to four. Uh, the number of spectral bands uh, is usually larger than three. So RGB representations like that's shown here uh, are useful for visual inspection, but clearly not complete. Um, for example, sensors such as uh, Iconos or GUI provide uh, a near infrared band in addition to, to the RGB channels. And so we have uh, four bands in total. Other satellites like WorldView 2 or 3 provide eight spectral bands distributed over the visible uh, near infrared spectrum. Uh, Pan Sharpen is a is a fusion problem that can involve uh, a single satellite or two different ones. Uh, in the latter case, the multispectral component and the pan are acquired in slightly different dates, typically a few days, uh, which can give rise to mismatches between the two components uh, due to local or global uh, temporal changes originated by anthropic or non-anthropic events, uh, moving objects, uh, weather conditions, flooding, uh, earthquakes, and whatever. Uh, in addition, uh, the PAN-MS registration can be not an easy task because of the different acquisition geometry uh, for the two satellites. Indeed, uh, even in, in the single sensor case, a minor a misalignment uh, at the subapixel level can occur. Uh, this is because of uh, small time lags occurring among the acquisitions of the different bands. In both cases, fast moving objects such as cars or other vehicles are subject to spatial shifts uh, across different bands. And summary, uh, we can classify different cases as follows. Uh, we can have a single multi-resolution sensor with registered bands or with a weak misalignment. Uh, if we are, you are doing cross-sensor fusion, then you can have aligned bands or severed sever misalignment. Uh, saying uh, aligned bands means uh, we are implicitly assuming that the registration problem uh, is addressed separately. In this talk, uh, we will assume the simplest configuration of a single sensor with uh, well-registered uh, bands. Uh, this table proposes a non-exhaustive list of popular multi-resolution satellites providing uh, PAN-MS pairs. Uh, in all cases, the resolution ratio is four, uh, while the number of bands can be four or eight. The radium Metric precision expressed in bits uh, per sample ranges from 10 to 12 bits. Uh, the spatial resolution of the pan uh, ranges from a couple of meters, for example, Gaufen 1, uh, up to 30 centimeters, uh, given by WorldView 3, which is an incredibly uh, small value uh, that allows one to accurately capture the shape of a relatively small 
uh, ground objects such as cars, uh, traffic signs, um, etc. Objects that appear uh, rather blurred or simply disappear in the corresponding multispectral uh, component, uh, which is at about 1.2 meters of uh, resolution. Notice also that uh, most of the mentioned satellites are still uh, operate, operating around the globe. Uh, here, uh, for some simple satellites, we can see the spectral response that characterizes each band, uh, including the panchromatic channel that is represented in the black. Um, as it can be seen, uh, there are frequencies covered by the multispectral bands, but not by the panchromatic band and vice versa. Uh, the band can register wavelengths that uh, they are not sampled or partially sampled by the multispectral bands. Uh, well, in, in practice, this means that uh, there can be objects in a scene that, that are visible in the pan uh, domain, but not in the multispectral domain and, uh, and, and vice versa. Uh, so uh, this makes more complex uh, and already it poses the inverse problem. As I said above, pan sharpening is just an example of data fusion, but it is worth to spend a few words on some strictly related tasks. Uh, we have already spoken about co-registration, uh, a sort of underlying issue that may arise in many fusion contexts, uh, like the same pan sharpening, but also uh, cross-sensor, cross-modality fusion, sub-optical fusion, multi-temporal processing, uh, and so forth. Uh, to some extent, co-registration may look similar to pan sharpening because uh, we have two images and want to warp one of them on the other's geometry. Uh, indeed, uh, if the misalignments among some spectral bands to be fused can be assumed as a rigid translation, then uh, a suitable definition of the last function can allow to address pan sharpening and registration jointly using, for example, convolutional neural networks. Another related task is the single image super resolution, where we have a single image in input to be super resolved. It looks very similar to pan sharpening, but uh, th there is no fusion to do because uh, we simply don't have any, uh, let's say, pan component uh, serving as a special reference. Uh, Multi-temporal fusion is another big chapter and can be declined in many different ways and with different goals. Uh, temporal and or, and or uh, spatial super resolution, um, feature extraction, classification of time series, uh, change detection, and so on. And finally, I would like to spend a few words on the, uh, on the multi-resolution fusion case uh, of Sentinel-2, uh, something that can be uh, regarded as a sort of um, generalized pan sharpening. Um, well, Sentinel-2 is an ASA mission aimed to monitor the health status at different scales. Uh, and as, a, as a result of his goals and of technological constraints, it has been designed to cover the visible to short wave infrared spectrum uh, with 13 spectral bands uh, acquired with different resolutions, 10 meters, 20 meters, and 60 meters. In this spectrum resolution plane, uh, we can see how these bands are defined. Uh, four bands operating in the visible near infrared range are provided at the finest resolution of 10 meters. All the other six bands uh, work at 20 meters, while the remaining ones, uh, which are most, mostly useful for uh, monitoring atmospheric conditions, are given at 60 meters. Therefore, it arises uh, a fusion problem whose ultimate goal is to rise the resolution of the 20 and 60 meter uh, uh, bands up to the finest resolution of 10 meters, uh, benefiting from the, the four finest resolution bands. 
uh, as actually uh, summarized in this slide. Uh, in some works, only the 20 meter bands are super resolved. Uh, it is the case of our our work that I'm citing here, but there are also works where uh, the 20 and the 60 meter bands are jointly brought at 10 meter. Um, as I've said, uh, this fusion task uh, generalizes the pan sharpening one. This is because we have uh, three resolution levels instead of two, and also we have four bands at the finest resolution uh, instead of uh, the single pan chromatic band. However, uh, there is another important difference uh, with the classical pan sharpening, which is the spectral uh, overlap between high resolution and low resolution bands. Here, there is nearly no overlap. Uh, whereas in pan sharpening, the pan component usually overlaps almost completely the spectrum covered by the MS component. Uh, of course, of course, this um, has implications on the de degree of correlation among the fused band and therefore on the complexity of the uh, problem. Well, after this parenthesis on uh, related tasks, uh, we can now summarize the main challenges for pan sharpening. The most critical feature is certainly the lack of ground suits the reference image to use for assessing objectively and any uh, designed algorithm by comparing its output with the ground truths. Uh, this is particularly uh, critical for uh, deep learning methods because this means that uh, there are no uh, reference images or labels, uh, if you prefer, to carry out uh, supervised training. Another relevant point is the scale dependency. Uh, to understand this, we have to recall that a good pan sharpening algorithm is a sensor dependent, uh, meaning that it is uh, customized for, um, for each different sensor. Uh, there are some attempts to get general algorithms that do not need to be particularized on the sensor of interest, but the results are below uh, expectations. Uh, this is a consequence among several reasons of the almost fixed scale of uh, observation. The spatial uh, resolution is fixed and um, related to the sense of physics and distance from the ground. Therefore, uh, ground objects are always observed at, at the same scale. From one side, this is an advantage, but it becomes a limitation from uh, a learning point of view, uh, or more in general, uh, from an assessment point of view. In fact, there are well-established synthesis protocols uh, that allow to generate uh, sample images with related ground truth, useful either for quality assessment or supervised training. Usually, uh, these protocols provide images at a different scale uh, that is uh, a reduced resolution scale. Uh, therefore, um, because of the statistical mismatch among different resolution scales, we are not guaranteed that any model designed, uh, trained, and assessed on uh, in the reduced resolution space will eventually generalize properly on full resolution data. Next, uh, the band misalignment uh, is a certain, certainly an additional problem, even if not so critical as the previous ones in, in most cases. About ill posedness, we have spent a few words above. Uh, um, in practice, it causes a certain amount of uncertainty in the determination of the best solution. Such a randomness can be reduced, making additional assumption about the relationship between the pan sharpened image and the two input components. Uh, this can be properly, uh, this can properly uh, constrain the problem, but. Uh, uh, at the price of too strong and not necessarily correct uh, hypothesis. Finally, a hot problem concerns the assessment. 
uh, reinvigorated in the last years uh, with the advent of deep learning as researchers are looking for suitable losses for training. Uh, but we will talk about this uh, later. Okay, so I've concluded the introduction. If there are questions, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer. If not, I will continue. Okay. Um, okay, let, let's move to the, to give a very quick look to some traditional approaches for punch sharpening. Uh, in particular, we recall two popular uh, paradigms, uh, the component substitution and the multi-resolution analysis. Uh, these two categories of methods have been deeply analyzed and discussed in the critical review on pan sharpening by Vivone and, and colleagues in 2015. So for more details, the interested students uh, can have a look to this paper or to his upgraded version recently published in 2021, which includes also variational uh, solutions and convolutional neural network based uh, solutions. Uh, here, uh, we just recall the best Basic principles underlying uh, the two methods that I've, uh, the two classical methods that I've uh, mentioned. Okay, so uh, component substitution and constant, uh, yeah, are based on uh, on very simple uh, idea on a very simple idea. There is the substitution of one of the MS uh, component uh, with the PAN component. Uh, to do this, uh, the multispectral image is first interpolated, uh, resized to the PAN scale, and then a suitable transformation is applied, for example, uh, principal component analysis or generalized uh, intensity hue saturation, Gram-Smith or other transformation. Once the MS is transformed, the related component, mostly related to the intensity, is exchanged with the PAN component. And before an inverse transform brings the image back to the original multispectral domain. Uh, here you can see an essential top level flowchart. Of course, we have discussed the basic principle, but in, in the practical implementations, uh, the substitution must be carried out with, with care, preserving, for example, the MS statistics. That's why we see an histogram matching step here. In multi-resolution analysis methods, uh, the exchange uh, between the pan and the multispectral component is selective with respect to the spatial frequency. Once the multispectral component is interpolated, uh, its high frequency component is almost empty. Although the image has been precise, there are no fine structure uh, inside. Um, a multi-resolution on the other side, side uh, a multi-resolution decomposition of the pan uh, allows one uh, to extract its high frequency component, uh, which can be added bandwise to the resized MS uh, using suitable injection gains. Uh, the separation of the high frequency component of interest is usually done using a pyramidal decomposition such as Laplacian or Wavelet. Uh, here is shown a high level flowchart for this category of methods uh, that singles out the essential steps for the for these methods. Uh, I will not comment further these approaches addressing the, the above mentioned to the above mentioned papers. Uh, those of you uh, that are interested to, to to get additional details. As last remark, I would like to stress that. Uh, there are other very important traditional approaches that are uh, that we are not talking about here. Uh, there's are statistical methods or variational methods. Uh, okay, that uh, basically uh, model the pan sharpening uh, as an inverse problem. If there are questions before moving to the, to the assessment problem, we can uh, uh, we can discuss a little bit. Is everything okay? Okay, 
So uh, let's go next. Okay, now uh, we, uh, we will have a look to the key issue of quality assessment uh, as this, is, this issue is uh, related to the definition of a loss for training. So for us, uh, this chapter uh, is important for this reason. Well, um, to start, let's, uh, let's say that if we would dispose of a ground truth, then we could directly assess objectively uh, the synthesis capability uh, of any uh, punch happening algorithm by comparison of the of our output with with the ground truth, uh, and the comparison can be done in many different ways. On the other hand, if we do not have ground truth, uh, we can resort to uh, consistency measurements, which are uh, indirect measures of quality. Uh, since the input is twofold, uh, comprising a multispectral term carrying the spectral information and the panchromatic term carrying mostly of the spatial information, in particular the high frequency details of the image, uh, we can leverage on two consistency checks that can be referred to as a spectral and spatial consistency uh, respectively. Of course, uh, in order to proceed with consistency check, it is necessary to assume a known uh, degradation models. That means transformations of the pan-sharpened image back to the input uh, components. Notice that um, lacking ground fruit, uh, synthetic labeled datasets can be created resulting to a resolution downgrade process for which uh, we need uh, degradation models. So uh, the availability of degradation models is a key point that is uh, uh, has to be addressed in both cases, even uh, either if we uh, proceed with supervised uh, check with ground truth or we proceed with consistency. Uh, consistency uh, check. And finally, in addition to the numerical assessment, uh, do not forget that it is a, a good practice to complete the evaluation by uh, visually inspecting sample results. This because subtle spatial artifacts or other form of synthesis error may not have a sensible impact on the numerical figures that we employ, uh, although they can be uh, detrimental for given applications. Let's see uh, then how to synthesize images with ground truth. The idea is very simple. Said are the resolution ratio between the MS and the PAN components. Uh, both images are rescaled by the same factor R as shown in this slide. Uh, on the left side, it is shown a real sample which has no ground truth and is therefore at uh, the original uh, or full resolution. In the right side, on the right side, sorry, uh, are shown the two synthetic uh, rescaled version of the MS and of the PAN components. Here, the resolution is lower, and we will refer to these samples as reduced resolution ones. The third sample, instead, is nothing but the original MS, uh, which plays now as a ground truth for the synthetic sample, rather than as input. Um, as, well, uh, as well known, to reduce the size of an image, suppose uh, by an integer factor, it is, not, uh, it, it is not sufficient a simple decimation. We need, in fact, a preliminary low-pass filtering to prevent aliasing phenomena. Uh, the choice of the low-pass filter, however, is not so obvious, and uh, it has an impact on the quality of the synthesized images. Let us therefore spend a few words on this point, which is of critical importance for, from the training uh, perspective. First of all, uh, let's clarify what's, uh, what is the modulation transfer function, call it uh, MTF for short. 
for any optical sensor. In extreme synthesis, uh, it summarizes the contrast characteristics of the sensor. In particular, uh, these characteristics can be quantified in the Fourier domain by measuring the sensor spectral response at the maximum spatial frequency. The spectral response, in fact, cannot be flat along the frequency axis due to the technological constraints. Uh, with this premise, it is clear that any synthesized image sample uh, for a given sensor should uh, mimic uh, its MTF properties. For this reason, it is a, a good practice to use a low-pass anti-aliasing filter in the downscaling process that uh, matches the MTF uh, property. Um, this means trivially fixing the uh, low-pass filter gain at the Nyquist frequency. Specifically, uh, Gaussian-shaped filters are usually employed and the MTF, MTF gain uh, changes uh, across the bands. So uh, slightly different low-pass filters are used for each uh, MS band and also for the PAN uh, component. Uh, well, in this talk and in practical session, uh, we will assume given uh, MTF gains. Usually these are given by the producers of the sensors or, or can be estimated somehow. In any case, uh, it is important to underline that uh, even with a perfectly matched MTF, uh, the statistics of the synthesized samples do not match perfectly those of the real data because the statistics are scale dependent. We can observe the scale dependency in some sample crops. These are crops from uh, a word view tree image. On the left hand, um, you have the original full resolution sample, the pan in the middle and multispectral, uh, uh, corresponding multispectral uh, on the right. Uh, in the third column on the, on the left uh, is, uh, is put a, a very good pan sharpening result that is marked as ground truth, even if it is not uh, really uh, a ground truth. We have put it there just to give uh, a better visual perception of the content of the image. On the right, uh, you have the synthesized, uh, reduced resolution samples. Again, you have the PAN and the MS component and the corresponding ground truth. In this case, the ground truth is nothing but the original MS, hence just a replica of the, of the nearby Coulomb uh, on, on its left. Well, from these images, um, it clearly emerged that some categories of objects or classes are subject to severe modification of the, of the spatial features, uh, moving from the full resolution scale to the reduced resolution one. For example, the vehicles uh, like cars, whose shape is well preserved in the full resolution uh, pan, uh, with these 30 centimeter wide pixels reduced to a few pixels in the synthesized pan with no hope to catch the object shape. Similar consideration hold for vegetation texture, uh, which play a crucial role for the discrimination of different species of plants. This can be noticed here uh, by looking at the three crowns in the middle example. Um, yeah, if you look at the synthesized pine on the right or to the related ground truth, you only see uh, some spots while textures are completely uh, lost. Or oh, we may continue with horizontal traffic uh, signs and many other categories of objects or, or classes. In summary, there's examples. Uh, say that uh, there can be whole categories of objects and stuff and classes that may not be represented properly 
in the synthesized data set obtained by resolution downgrade. And this can be an issue from both evaluation and training perspectives. Well, once clarified the limits of the synthesis process, it remains to decide what error function to use. On one side, we have general purpose uh, cost functions uh, that are popular in the image processing domain. For example, the peak signal to noise ratio, the structural similarity, the mean square error, the mean absolute error, and or any other L norm. Uh, however, in the remote sensing domain, uh, there can be specific needs that can, that can call for application-oriented quality uh, measures. Notable examples are ergas uh, and non-dimensional global and relative synthesis error figure, uh, SAM, which is spectral angle mapper, or the Q index, uh, which is a quality index that compares uh, image statistics. Uh, so, well, but uh, eventually, uh, which is the function uh, that is most suited to be used for uh, for training? Uh, indeed, some uh, general purpose metrics uh, have the advantage to respond to, to some optimality, optimality criterion and most uh, important to be very simple to implement, uh, suggesting their use as a loss function for training. It is in particular the case of the L norms, uh, which are the most popular losses employed in pan sharpening. One popular index for pan sharpening, as I said above, uh, is uh, certainly uh, ERGAS. Uh, here's this definition, which is motivated by the observation that uh, remotely sensed uh, multispectral images uh, can show unbalanced statistics across different spectral bands. Therefore, the bandwise root mean square error is uh, relativized to the band average value can be, that can be measured on the ground truth, for example. Uh, then uh, some divisions by the number of bands and resolution ratio allow to get a non-dimensional index. In summary, uh, we can think to this measure as a sort of a generalized root mean square error. Another popular index is the spectral angle mapper, the estimated spectral signature at any location. Uh, there is a vector uh, is compared to easel reference taken from the ground truth in terms of uh, angular divergence. Uh, the average angle over the whole spatial domain provides uh, the final index. By definition, um, SAM is insensitive to magnitude differences as the angle is not function of it. This can be a desirable feature in applications where the relative proportions among uh, bands response count more than their uh, absolute value. Uh, for example, for soil classification or other uh, applications. So the intensity in fact, uh, can be affected by, uh, can be heavily affected by weather conditions, uh, pollutions, uh, or other aspects, uh, whereas the, the spectral uh, proportions may be less, uh, more robust, more insensitive to this uh, atmospheric conditions. So we can give more importance to the uh, preservation of the spectral proportions among the, among the spectral bands. Another reference-based index is a generalization of uh, uh, to the multiband case of a well-known uh, universal image quality index, the uh, UIQI, uh, originally defined by Wong and Bovic, uh, and that was defined for a single band and is reported here. Uh, and it involves basically image statistics of the predicted image and of the reference image and can be factored for an easier interpretation in three components. Uh, one accounting for the correlation between the two images, one um, for the difference in the average contrast, and the third one 
for the difference in the average intensity. Momentums are typically computed on uh, 32 by 32 uh, sliding patches. So eventually this index does not account for punctual differences uh, directly, but it uh, rather uh, assess the appearance features uh, through local statistics. In contrast uh, to these indexes that require the availability of reference images, ground fruits, there are others, uh, as I said above, uh, to check consistency rather than synthesis properties. And uh, these do not need uh, ground fruit images. Uh, for this reason, these are often referred to as no reference quality indexes. The difference between synthesis and consistency check in the specific context of pan sharpening is summarized in this picture. The dashed line uh, lines highlight the path to follow for synthesis check. The test or training uh, image is first rescaled and then pan sharpened before to be compared uh, using any metric M. Uh, with the reference ground root that is the original MS highlighted with a uh, with a red uh, red box. Uh, the measure M can be ergas SM, whatever uh, error function. On the contrary, uh, for consistency check, the input image is pan sharpened first. So in this case, the pan sharpening is run on full resolution real data. The outcome is then reprojected back to the MS scale for a spectral consistency check, consisting in a comparison with the original MS using, again, any index M. Besides, the same pan-sharpened image uh, can be compared with the single band pan component for spatial consistency check. Uh, this can be done through a proper distortion index D to be uh, discussed and defined. Um, and of course, we have to average somehow uh, along the spectral dimension before or after, after the, the comparison between the output image and the pan uh, image. So you either project the fused image in the pan domain, but, but you need to know how, and then make the comparison, or you compare first each band of the fused image with the pan, and then make an average along the spectral uh, dimension. In practice, since the PAN to MS projection is not an obvious mapping for the spatial assessment, it can be more common to compare uh, derivative features or some statistics rather than absolute uh, pixel values. Well, in practice, there are uh, what are the no reference uh, indexes? Uh, there are many, and there's are just a few mini meaningful examples. Uh, two popular distortion indexes uh, for spectral consistency check are due to uh, Alparone and colleagues and to Khan and uh, his colleagues, uh, respectively. They are denoted as uh, D lambda and D lambda K. In the same work, Alparone uh, and colleagues also introduced a spatial distortion index, DS. Um, a few months ago, me and Matteo, we have also proposed a spatial index, a spatial index that we, we are going to discuss um, in a moment. Okay, uh, concerning spectral consistency, we are confident enough that uh, Kant's distortion index is quite effective and, and reliable. This index resorts to, to the Q, uh, Q4 or Q8, depending on the number of bands, a reference-based quality index uh, that we have introduced above. Uh, according with the general scheme that we have just seen, uh, the per sharpening image is, um, is downscaled with a low pass uh, filtering uh, followed by a decimation. And then the resulting image is compared to the, to the input MS using uh, this Q uh, index. 
Moving to the spatial consistency check, the problem is more complex. It will be easier uh, if we could rely on a degradation rule uh, to reduce the multiple bands of the pan sharpened image to a single band, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have such a model or such a rule. Uh, so a clever idea by Alparone and colleagues is to, uh, was to check the constancy across different scales of the statistics that relate the pan to the spectral bands. Consider four images, uh, the pan P, the pan sharpened image M hat, both have the highest resolution and the two corresponding downscaled versions. So the, the, the reduced resolution pan and the MS, the original MS. Um, now, uh, in this formula, we simply take each spectral band uh, and measure the, the relationship with the pan through the image quality uh, function uh, Q. Uh, and uh, we do this for each band and um, we uh, compare this uh, value, this relationship uh, that we register on the two uh, different resolution. So the distortion index becomes a zero when the PAN-MS relationship does not change across the two resolution levels. The idea is interesting but it has also some limitations. And first, it is not obvious that uh, the PAN-MS relationship is a scale invariant. Second, the scaling of the PAN is subject to an arbitrary choice about the low-pass filtering to be used. Uh, this has an impact on the statistics and then on, the on the final result. Uh, third, in addition to the spatial consistency, uh, the spectral, uh, the spectral one can play a role and uh, in some cases uh, be dominant, which means that this index may register both spectral and spatial consistency. Uh, uh, this because of the structure of the Q function. For those reasons, we, we, me and Matteo, uh, we have recently proposed uh, an alternative solution uh, to assess the spatial consistency. Uh, we resort to the local uh, correlation coefficient between the pan and each pan sharpened band. The local coefficient is computed using a relatively small sliding window and then uh, averaging with respect to the spatial and the spectral dimensions. The small scale, uh, for example, four by four, uh, in practical, uh, in our practical implementation, we use this value, so four by four, allows to concentrate on the injected uh, spatial details of the pan sharpened image and uh, reduce the connection with the spectral con consistency. Other indexes which make use of the correlation coefficient actually exist, but, uh, but they use much larger values uh, for the scale, like 32 by 32, and usually refer to the gradient image rather than uh, directly to the, to the image. To give uh, an idea about the complexity of the spatial quality assessment, we can give a look to this example. This is a part of a wide comparison among tens of pan sharpening methods, but we show only the best four solutions according to DS and the best four uh, according to DRAW. Um, this on a single test image, uh, from which we have extracted uh, three details for an easier uh, visual inspection. In the middle column, uh, there is the full resolution pan. Uh, that is our reference for the spatial quality. Uh, the top DS and D row solutions are on the left and on the right, respectively, ordered uh, in a way that the closer to the pan, the better the score. 
In this case, it seems that the row provides indications that are more consistent with the visual perception. On the other hand, uh, one may also argue that the solutions that minimize the row uh, are over-correlated to the pan, and some special patterns or textures are overemphasized. Uh, emphasize it. Of course, we have discussed uh, this single result, uh, but it, it helps to understand uh, how difficult uh, the assessment of the spatial quality is, uh, whereas the assessment of the spectral quality uh, actually can be considered substantially well addressed by Kahn's index uh, that provides satisfying indications. Well, finally, it is worth to mention, to keep in mind uh, that, that there are also uh, hybrid consistency indexes. There are just combinations, for example, geometric mean uh, of spatial and spectral distortion index. Uh, the quality no reference index, is, uh, known as QNR index, is a popular uh, example, but there are others. Uh, in general, these indexes are useful because uh, they give a single overall answer, but they must be handled with care for the following reasons. Uh, if one factor is unreliable, for example, the spatial distortion, then the wall measure will be unreliable. Uh, also, uh, the two images uh, may have a different dynamics or be not homogeneous. Okay, so personally, I prefer to not mix the two things, and usually I judge uh, the spectral and the spatial qualities. Uh, separately, even if uh, this can be limiting, because uh, in some cases you cannot clearly say uh, that one method is better than another uh, in absolute terms. And how in practice, uh, there are a lot of publicly available tools for quality assessment and comparison. The richest and the most popular one is probably uh, the first of this list by Vivone et al. that provides uh, both state-of-the-art methods, component substitution, multi-resolution, variational, deep learning, and also quality uh, indexes. Uh, thanks to heat, any new method can be easily compared to the state-of-the-art. Additional indexes like the spatial consistency uh, index d raw discussed about and others are also made available to the second reference. And also on the other side, we have, um, it has been recently published a paper, a toolbox paper, uh, where you, uh, you can find the most credited CNN models for, um, for pan sharpening. So uh, you have this important repository and references to use if you would like to uh, to work on this topic. Well, this uh, concludes this, uh, this first part on quality assessment. Uh, and it would be a pleasure to me to answer to, to your question now. Uh, and then we can have a break, of course, because uh, we have spent already uh, almost 50 minutes um, without, uh, without stop. Uh, so uh, are there questions? Okay, there are no questions. This means two things, one of two things. Either you understand everything or nothing. So I hope is the first one, uh, the case. So, okay, we have a, a question. Okay, the question is uh, if there's assessment techniques can be used for super resolution assessment. Okay, SR means super resolution. So, um, yes, 
Yes, the answer um, partially. For example, if we think of uh, uh, what I guess the question is about the consistency check, because for synthesis, for synthesis check, uh, the answer is yes, without doubts. Uh, for consistency check, uh, what you can do is to check the uh, spectral consistency, because you can take your super resolved image and uh, make a degradation of this image and compare the, the degraded version uh, of your output with the input image. You don't have a panchromatic band with which to uh, assess the consistency, uh, the spatial consistency, okay? Maybe you can have some other source image and maybe you can uh, check also the spatial consistency. So that's, uh, I don't know if um, my answer was uh, responding correctly to the question, if I intended it correctly or not. Yes, I got that, perfect. Thank you. Uh, are there uh, other questions? Okay, you can think about also during the break, if you, you have some uh, doubt and you want to better think what you want to ask, uh, I will check the, the chat also when I'll be back after this, uh, uh, this break. So uh, I, I will say that we can, uh, we, can, uh, we can start again at uh, 11, 10. Okay, so just take uh, more than 10 minutes of break. Thank you very much. I, I remind you that if some uh, someone wants to in, in the practical session, this I told this in at the beginning, uh, but maybe uh, somebody has uh, has uh, joined the the, the the meeting later. So in the second part, you you can experience with Kaggle. Uh, to this purpose, you you sh you should have an account on Kaggle. So if you have a problem with the registration on Kaggle. Uh, please uh, raise your hand. Matteo is online. I can answer. I can support you. Also in this break, if you if you need to um, to solve any any problem, uh, recall that uh, to use the GPU on Kaggle, it it will be necessary to to provide a phone number during your registration. So this is just is uh, probably the just uh, the, the, the one point that can be critical for uh, doing the registration. So uh, that's important. So, uh, okay, let's have a break and uh, see you see you later.
Okay, welcome back. Um, okay, we can uh, continue now. If there are no uh, questions that you may have uh, processed uh, uh, during the break. So, okay. Um, we can now move to, um, to deep learning based approaches, focusing first uh, on data set preparation for training. Uh, regardless of the specific deep learning uh, network to be employed. Later, we will see different models that are in practice uh, fully convolutional neural networks that allows to, to do punch sharpening. Let's review uh, the synthesis process to get labeled data for assessment. In supervised training, uh, we have exactly the same problem that we have in a testing, that is uh, the lack of ground truth. So uh, same problem, same, same solution, uh, which is the resolution downgrade. The resolution, uh, the reduced resolution space, um, we have scale in, here we have a scaled inputs for which uh, uh, the original MS plays as ground truth, okay? So uh, in detail, in addition to the low pass filtering and decimation steps uh, that are applied to each multispectral band and to the PAN, the reducing resolution MS has to be resized to, 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 to reach the, 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 the PAN scale. And this can be done via uh, interpolation. Uh, of course, uh, the same interpolation rule uh, that we use during the training uh, should be used at test time, otherwise uh, we have a, a mismatch that causes a performance less uh, loss. Uh, finally, um, the resized input and the original uh, MS that plays as ground root uh, will undergo a, a tiling process to create uh, input output patches to be arranged in uh, mini batches in mini batches for uh, training or validation uh, once again we underline the importance of using proper low pass filters uh, that match uh, the MTF uh, characteristics of the sensor. The MTF uh, characterizes the, the contrast level of the sensor and is band dependent uh, and is uh, roughly approximated uh, usually through a Gaussian shaped filter that uh, is designed in the Fourier domain uh, specifying his uh, response at the Nyquist frequency. And the Nyquist frequency, uh, you know, is inversely proportional to the resolution ratio of our uh, decimation. Uh, well, um, all this stuff uh, is a standard processing, and you will see uh, the related codes with Matteo in the hands-on session. Now, um, let's recall uh, the fundamental principles to set up a balanced and representative data set for an experimental validation. Uh, firstly, given a volume of data, it is a good practice to reserve the majority of the input out sam output samples uh, to the training phase. Uh, the remaining part can be equally split between validation uh, for checking overfitting situations uh, and test. Second question, what's the optimal uh, crop size? In our original uh, paper, uh, PNN, our first paper, we followed the practice that was already um, present in the related task of super resolution, uh, where deep learning appeared uh, a few years before then, uh, on pan sharpening. Uh, well, in this case, we used a relatively small size, 33 by 33. Uh, and this was a, a result of a compromise between uh, the need to keep the limited, uh, limited to the use of uh, memory of the GPU and also uh, the need for, uh, of creating uh, mini batches uh, of a reasonable size 
uh, with the samples that are well distributed over large areas so that mini batches can be um, as much uh, representative as possible. In recent works, uh, thanks to the increased capacity of the latest GPUs, uh, the patch size reaches also 500 by 500 and, and may be increased further. Indeed, uh, observe that patches cannot be too small and a lower bound is determined by the network complexity, in particular um, by the depth and the kernel size. In fact, uh, repeated convolutions produce border effects and therefore um, a frame of the output image of a certain uh, thickness must be excluded from the computation of the loss because it is affected by border effects. Uh, this occurs uh, automatically if we know uh, if no padding is set in the convolutional layers. And in this case, the, the activation maps are progressively shrinked. Once fixed, um, the number of patches, um, well, once fixed the, the, the size, uh, the number of patches determines the overall volume of data. Um, in principle, the larger the training data volume, uh, the better the network will uh, generalize. Uh, however, particularly for sensors uh, conceived for commercial purposes, uh, think of word view, for example, collecting sufficient data may be costly. Uh, to have a rough, uh, rough size value, uh, we, we recall here the choices that we have made in, in PNN, our first paper on, on punch sharpening, and in recent survey toolbox paper uh, by Deng at, uh, and colleagues. The, in the, uh, the number of patches in both works, you can see, is in the order of 10,000 in both cases. Um, the batch size. Uh, usually ranges between 32 and, 30 and 64. Uh, of course, this, if the patches are not too big, if the patch are, are, uh, patches are too big, then you have to choose a smaller value uh, for the batch size. And finally, um, in order to ensure a good uh, generalization, the data set must be, must be sufficiently representative of, of different situations. So it is suggested to use uh, images acquired in different uh, dates, possibly reflecting uh, different uh, weather uh, uh, conditions or daylight conditions, um, and also possibly uh, showing different kind of environments. The above considerations mostly apply to the training data sets. Uh, for validation, uh, we can use the same batch and batch sizes, while for testing, it is better to use larger crops, for example, 1000 by 1000 or larger, um, for a visual assessment at a glance. Uh, anyhow, uh, once dimensioned the partition, if you dispose of it, let's say, n different images, uh, it remains to decide how to select the crops reserved for training validation and test. Here we show two extremal hypotheses, uh, but you can figure intermediate options, of course. Uh, in, the in the first hypothesis, we perform an intra-scene uh, partition uh, in train validation and test. In this case, we take full advantage from the variety of available images at the training time. On the other hand, for the, the, the validation and test data sets um, are well aligned with the, with the training data set. Therefore, uh, we cannot really assess the generalization capability of the training the networks. In the second case that we call uh, cross scene partition, we leave out images for validation and for test. By doing so, the training uh, dataset loses a little bit of uh, generality, 
uh, but the data sets uh, are misaligned and this allows to to check the uh, generalization of uh, the network okay of course uh, the first partition can be always operated the latter the second method uh, requires the availability of more images. So sometimes we have just one image, so we don't have a choice. So if we use one image, then um, it's unavoidable to have uh, training and validation data sets that are statistically very, uh, very well uh, aligned. And these, uh, you know, in the, in the test phase, so it's not very good for for assessing the quality uh, of a method that could, that could be overfitted on the, on the training image and then uh, perform uh, very well on images that are very similar to the to the test uh, to the training image. Um, yeah, to conclude this part on data preparations, let's paint a few words about normalization and augmentation. Uh, the normalization we have essential for, for normalization, we have essentially two main options. There are also other options, but the most frequent are these two. Uh, we can either shift the image dynamic uh, in the zero one interval. This can be easily done by dividing by. Uh, the maximum uh, value, you know, the, the is a function of the number of the resolu the radiometric resolution. So it depends on the number of bits per sample. So uh, in this case, we just have to divide by uh, two rise to the number of bits per sample. Uh, or we can, uh, as an alternative, um, normalize the statistics um, on a set of images, and this can be done sub subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, and this can be done also um, bandwise, uh, even if it is not necess necessary. Um, actually, both options work fairly well, especially when uh, working with networks that resort to uh, residual blocks. But we, we will uh, come back on this point later. Uh, besides, we may uh, insert also uh, batch normalization layers in, in the net, but don't expect too much from this. In our experience, batch normalization does not give uh, appreciable gain on, uh, on pan sharpening. Um, for that augmentation, well, uh, that this is another popular trick in deep learning to increase the generality of a data set. As you likely know, uh, there are infinite combinations of transformations which can be devised to this purpose, but in practice, uh, that should be uh, selected with care as many transformations could be uh, redundant, or even, if not even uh, detrimental. Uh, so uh, our general suggestion is to do not exaggerate with data augmentation. Uh, while horizontal and vertical flips or rotations can help, uh, scale changes may not. In fact, as I have already underlined, in remote sensing imagery, the resolution is uh, fixed uh, per a sensor, okay? Uh, any kind of object or texture has its own scale uh, of occurrence. And therefore, eventual rescaled samples would not be uh, representative of uh, real cases. Okay, are there questions on uh, on this uh, short part on uh, data set uh, preparation? Okay. Let's, uh, let's um, move next. We can now focus on, on the most popular CNN models for pan sharpening. First of all, 
Oh, we distinguish two main categories. The early approaches rely on the supervised paradigm and consequently uh, requiring the ground truths, uh, they perform the training phase on a reduced resolution data sets. The last generation models, on the other hand, follow uh, the unsupervised approach and training uh, on full resolution real data. Uh, in this case, uh, we, of course, uh, need uh, consistency losses rather than synthesis losses. Uh, in addition to these main categories, there are also examples of hybrid solutions that, for example, com combine a reduced resolution, full resolution losses or introduce uh, adversarial loss terms and and other, and other tricks. In this talk, we will mainly focus on, um, on, on the first category and partially on the second approach uh, that uh, is based on full resolution training. We cannot start but from our uh, very popular net, which is likely the first uh, CNN uh, that was specifically designed for Panchapani, uh, known as a PNN, Panchapani Neural Net. Uh, this network was inspired by a super resolution technique uh, proposed by Dong et al. And um, it is composed of just three convolutional layers that are interleaved uh, by ReLU activation functions. Prior to enter the ConvNet, the multispectral component is resized to match the spatial dimension of the pan, uh, and this will form a single uh, input uh, input data cube. For example, if we have Iconos image, this data cube has a spatial size of the pan and is composed of five bands, four spectral bands plus the pan chromatic one. The preliminary uh, the preliminary resize of the MS can be done in many different ways and is not really crucial in our experience. Uh, needless to say, uh, the same mapping rule must be used in both training and test. So if I create a training data using this interpol one interpolation rule, then the same interpolation rule that has to be uh, embedded in the uh, final uh, network that uh, that will be tested. In particular, for PNN, uh, we used a 23-tap interpol uh, polynomial interpolator. Uh, other people use Bikubic or uh, nearest neighbor interpolations or bilinear or even uh, learnable resizing layer layers. Uh, the number of learnable parameters of PNN is relatively small, lesser than 100,000 uh, parameters. It depends on the number of bands, indeed. Uh, so if you use Iconos, you have a smaller, uh, a smaller number of parameters with respect to, get, to, to word view, for example. Uh, the number of bands for PNN is four or eight. Uh, in, it depends also on the uh, on the the width of the layers, which for the basic configuration that we have here is forty eight for the first layer, thirty two. So we have thirty two uh, activation maps in the second layer, and in the output layer we have uh, B uh, B uh, activation maps, or the, there are just the bands that uh, I'm predicting reconstructing. Um, finally, also the receptive field uh, has an impact on the on the number of parameters. Uh, here it was uh, nine by nine in the first layer and five by five in the second in the second and third layer. So all these hyper parameters determine the total number of learnable parameters, of course. In the PNN paper, we have conducted also an interesting analysis aimed to explain the shapes of the learned kernels. Uh, we found in particular that several kernels um, actually um, learn to produce approximations of popular remote sensing features, uh, such as vegetation index or water index, 
uh, that are usually defined as simple combinations of band pairs. Uh, in particular, they are normalized differences. We have the expressions here on the bottom. Um, you can see here uh, some such kernels, the number seven and the, the 40, uh, 48. Um, and uh, well, uh, we have, uh, since we have in this case, we are on world view two images that has nine spectral bands. So the kernel uh, in the input layer uh, is a cube nine by nine by nine. So uh, the kernel can be shown uh, using nine spectral slices. Uh, the colored frames helps to associate the slice of the weights uh, uh, to the related spectral bands. And also uh, brighter patches indicate uh, a positive multiplier for the related band, while darker uh, ones indicate negative gain for the corresponding band. So uh, this helps to explain why for these cases um, we get activation maps in the third column that look like popular uh, index uh, such as uh, NDY or NDWI that are obtained by suitable band, uh, band differentiation. So the, well, the correspondence, uh, correspondence is highlighted by the, the red lines obtained by thresholding of these uh, activations on, the, on, on one side and features, uh, model-based features on the, on the other side. So you can see uh, how this uh, match uh, very well. Um, Okay, based on this observation, in the same PNN paper, it was proposed a variant that was called uh, later uh, PNN IDX, where features such as NDY and NDWI and likes uh, are added uh, to the input layer uh, with the hope that these would uh, facilitate the network to learn better or faster the target task. And actually this goal was achieved in terms of training time. Uh, the additional inputs are easily computed, the ones uh, for all offline before starting the training. At test time, of course, they are computed online, combining the interested uh, bands according to the index uh, definition. Indeed, um, Starting from 2017, uh, many CNN pan sharpening models appeared, including our advanced version of PNN. Uh, these models are now collected in a single toolbox made available to the community, uh, whose related paper is given on the, on the bottom of this slide. Uh, well, all these subsequent solutions present a distinctive feature uh, which is the use of uh, residual learning. And all leverage on uh, reduced resolution training framework. So they are supervised models. Let's then uh, quickly review those models. And can start, we can start from, um, from our advanced uh, PNN. Uh, the advanced version of PN, PNN uh, presents uh, three main innovations with respect to the uh, original PNN. Uh, one is the use of uh, L1 loss that replaced the L2 loss, which was used in, in the original work. And this has speeded up a little bit the training. Um, the second innovation is the residual learning that is obtained by a simple skip connection that is shown here. Uh, with a red uh, connection. Uh, and the third was the use or the introduction of the uh, target adaptive uh, protocol. Well, actually, uh, considering that, um, why we use this skip connection, so considering that the low pass content of the image that we want to predict is already uh, present in the input, and it is just the multispectral component, uh, we can reasonably uh, expect that a global skip bringing uh, the input MS directly to the output 
will uh, allow uh, the, the network to focus on the missing part, which is the high frequency component, or if you prefer, detailed image. By doing so, uh, the resulting network presents uh, several advantages. It is more stable uh, with lesser dependence on data normalization, illumination conditions, uh, etc. The training is much faster. The network generalizes better. As a matter of fact, uh, residual learning is now a standard option for any punch happening network. In this case, we have used a single global residual block with, tre with three uh, skipped uh, comb layers. Other networks include more residual uh, modules. We will refer to this modified PNN architecture as APNN uh, to be distinguished from the APNN FT that includes also uh, the target adaptation or fine tuning phase. Okay. Um, well, uh, what is uh, target adaptation? Well, this scheme explains uh, what the target adaptation protocol means. Uh, the core is the APNN network, which is the residual version of PNN, which is enclosed in the shaded uh, boxes. Um, it is replicated here for clarity, but we have just one net. And starting from a model pre-trained uh, offline, um, at inference time, the adaptation um, follows the, the solid line paths that you can see here. In essence, we do nothing but what is done at training time with the difference that we use the test image. The network has in initial parameters that are almost ready to use uh, and we run relatively few tuning iterations and this value is 50 in the standard configuration. So for the, for the tuning, the MS and the PAN need to be rescaled as usual, performing a resolution downgrade. Uh, then the, uh, the new MS input needs to be resized, okay, to reach the PAN size, and this will form the reduced resolution input data cube uh, that will feed uh, the APNN for its tuning. Tuning that is run in a supervised manner, thanks to the uh, GT that is now available uh, because it is just the MS input. So you can see the loss node that takes an input also, the, the output, the punch sharpened image and the uh, MS uh, original non-scaled uh, uh, MS image. This tuning, of course, uh, is made um, possible thanks to the self-supervised nature of the training uh, that we are doing at reducer resolution, because it is self-supervised because we can generate training samples from the same input in a, an automatic uh, manner. So we don't need to manually annotate any image so this can that's why we can do target adaptation uh, well this scheme of course is uh, general and uh, can be applied to any cnn model but uh, of course it is more suited for relatively uh, small networks uh, to satisfy memory and uh, time constraints during the tuning phase so that has to be uh, has to take uh, just maybe a few minutes but not more than than that so uh, once the, the the tuning is completed when you do your 50 uh, iterations of tuning then uh, the model uh, you can see uh, the second shaded uh, box uh, will uh, became uh, um, operative and will take the full resolution input uh, to make uh, your final prediction or your of uh, your uh, pan sharpened image. So the tuning applies at a reduced scale and then uh, 
uh, after uh, the param after that we after the parameters are frozen we can run it again but on the full resolution original uh, target image let's uh, let's look now at another uh, popular network which is uh, the pan net uh, this net leverages on a more uh, extensive uh, use of residual learning uh, with a global skip connection uh, as in the advanced PNN, but also with the presence of a cascade of four uh, residual blocks. Moreover, the authors decided to feed the convolutional section uh, only uh, with the high pass components of both uh, PAN and MS. Although this model looks deeper than PNN, the overall weight in terms of number of parameters uh, is approximately the same because it uses smaller convolutional kernels. This model, as well uh, as the next ones, are still uh, is still supervised, and uh, it requires uh, the same resolution downgrade protocol. Uh, to synthesize uh, training uh, samples, okay? To see a heavier model, we can move to uh, the RPNN, which is, which is the deep residual pan-sharpening neural net. Uh, this net is composed of 11 comb layers uh, these are thicker with respect to the previous networks with more activation maps per layer and uh, seven by seven kernel supports. Um, you can also you can also see a global skip connection for residual learning. Uh, this net is about 10 times heavier than uh, PNN or PAN net in terms of number of parameters. A little more creative architecture is proposed in this work, uh, which leverages on a, a multi-scale and multi-depth concept. Uh, there are two branches. Uh, one uh, PNN-like uh, branch provides, uh, let's say, shallow features. The other branch, composed of uh, ad hoc uh, blocks uh, called multi-scale residual blocks, provide, let's say, uh, deep or multi-scale features and multi-scale features. Uh, overall, however, the net is relatively light and makes use of a L2 norm like PNN or DRPNN that use the same, uh, the same norm. Here is another kind of architecture uh, using a uh, a bidirectional two branch topology. On the top branch, uh, following right, flowing rightward, the MS is upscaled in two steps using fractionally strided convolutions that are learnable uh, layers. Um, well, and this realized the, the upscaling in two steps. In the opposite direction, leftward, uh, the pan is downscaled in two steps using sequences of convolutions, uh, residual blocks, uh, pooling. Okay, uh, the pan branch uh, conveys its features on the MS branch in the in two points uh, corresponding to intermediate and final scales respectively. It is used a particular loss function here that is called a Charbonnier loss, a, lo a function that basically approximates the L1 norm when the error is, uh, is uh, sufficiently large, but uh, it has also an offset loss when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when the error is, uh, is zero or close to zero. Uh, there is no much to say about this other network, the ICNN, that is very similar to our APNN. Uh, this has three layers, but that are slightly different, with slightly different hyperparameters that makes the network a little lighter with respect to APNN. And there is no target adaptation here, of course. Finally, FusionNet looks quite similar to, to PanNet. 
uh, as it has uh, four residual blocks on the on the backbone and a global skip connection. However, in input, the low pass components are not discarded, as in PAN, because in PAN we we, we make the, the high pass filtering. Uh, and here we take uh, a difference between the PAN and the MS, which replace the the concatenation that us is usually. Uh, utilized to to make this uh, to, to feed uh, pan sharpening models. Well, the idea is to give an input uh, a sort of a detailed component, letting the network to learn how to perform the the injection on the multispectral uh, part. Uh, this is a clear attempt to to merge. Uh, modern approaches like deep learning and traditional ones, such as uh, multi-resolution analysis or component substitution. Well, in summary, all the models that I've quickly described have been collected uh, in a single toolbox related to this uh, paper. Uh, in, in, the, in the paper, these are uh, also compared uh, on different data sets and different conditions. For example, in this screenshot, the models are compared in terms of number of parameters versus accuracy in the reduced resolution framework uh, within indexes like Q, SAM, Ergas, uh, that are based on the reference uh, ground truth. Well, um, actually, I, I won't go into the details of the proposed comparison, as it would require a non-trivial and not short uh, discussion. I just wanted to give you some uh, direction uh, to do it by yourself in case you you are interested. Uh, well, to conclude this part, uh, as the practical session will will be concerned on on PNN and its variants, here we assume the very few code lines to define, in particular, uh, the APNN model. Uh, in PyTorch. Uh, this is one simple way to define a CNN as a class. So in the constructor, you define the first three standalone layers with related hyperparameters. Then a forward function establishes connections among layers, including the, the global skip connection encoded in the last instruction. And also you, you can see that the activation function to use in this case, ReLU, can be specified uh, here in the forward uh, function. Uh, now, we also have some uh, auxiliary variables like the cropping size that accounts for the, the shrinking that you have on the activation maps because of the repeated convolutions. So these parameters uh, is important at the end uh, to combine, you know, the, the 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 content that you you bring to the output through the skip connection with the uh, feature restructured by the backbone. So when you do this combination, you have to align the, the two the two sides so uh, to get a consistent a consistent combination and compute then uh, your loss if you are in training, for example. Okay, so this concludes this. Um, um, the part, uh, this part on models, and uh, it's time for question, uh, if any. Okay. So we are going to conclude this this talk. Um, okay. Um, all the models we have reviewed up to now uh, are based on supervised training uh, that is made feasible thanks to um, to a shift in the reduced resolution space. 
To be more precise, we should talk uh, uh, of supervised learning, as I, I told you uh, above, since the labeled training samples are synthesized from the same input images without the need of ma uh, manual notation. Uh, and this is uh, done thanks to a fully automated uh, downgrading process. Uh, in, the, in the last few years, um, it has been observed a paradigm shift toward uh, a fully unsupervised um, approach that operates on full resolution data at training time. And we have also uh, proposed our solution and that, that is what I'm going to present in, the, in this last part. Okay, it's to gain insight on this paradigm, uh, we can review the concept of synthesis and consistency assessment. Actually, uh, this uh, flowchart uh, well summarizes the difference uh, between reduced resolution and full resolution training. Uh, this should not surprise uh, as assessment and training have the, the same ultimate goal that is the minimization of some error function. So starting from the original sample in the, in the upper left corner, a resolution shift, so you can follow the dashed lines, brings the sample in the reduced resolution space uh, where pan sharpening uh, applies applies then uh, afterward the, the synthesis accuracy uh, is quantified through any index uh, m moving the focus on consistency check we apply pan sharpening to the original full resolution sample here we need two assessment functions one can be the same m but the output need to be uh, rescaled. Uh, the other is uh, some function D, which somehow combines the output and, and the pan. In this way, we can check both uh, spectral and uh, spatial consistency. From the training point of view, if we want to, uh, to follow the same reasoning, uh, we have to define two proper loss terms that encode the consistency assessment and of course, we do not need to perform scaling on the input samples in this case. Well, this training paradigm shift is summarized in these two pictures. We have defined some shorthand symbols here. For example, the double circles indicate original images, subscript 0, 1, etc. indicate the resolution, which can be, for example, for world view 3, uh, 31 centimeters, uh, scale zero, uh, 1.24 um, meters for uh, index one, etc. We have an operator D that indicates a resolution downgrade. Uh, we have the concatenation C, loss of terms, whatever. Um, well, uh, we also uh, have parameters uh, phi uh, zero and phi one. We we distinguish the two set of parameters because they have been learned on, on at different scales. So it is it is a good thing. It is important to to to, to recall that uh, these parameters have uh, of or carry different experiences. Um, okay, while in the former case the loss basically uh, quantifies a reconstruction error comparing the pan sharpening image with the ground truth, the M1 variable. In the latter case, the two loss terms uh, have to uh, assess consistency and their definition uh, and their definition is less obvious. And they're not just differences among images. As you can figure, the presented a full resolution framing for framework leverages on the definition of suited loss terms but it's general uh, as it can be applied to any network uh, from shallower to deeper ones. Well, actually, this is what we have done in our paper reported here. Uh, in particular, we have tested uh, the full resolution training framework uh, on three popular CNN models. There are APNN, PANNET, and DRPNN. 
Also, we have kept the target adaptivity mode with the tuning operating in this case at full resolution um, rather than at reduced resolution. To highlight that uh, the net uh, learned on full resolution data, uh, we also label these variants as zoom versions. Uh, for example, APNN trained at full resolution uh, is called uh, zoom PNN or simply zeta PNN. Well, uh, in particular, this scheme describes how the target adaptivity uh, declines at full resolution. And this uh, the declination is much simpler with respect to the previous scheme because we are just one skill. We don't have to uh, switch between the reduced resolution and full resolution scales. Uh, the target image, in fact, uh, is in the middle of this picture. Uh, well, first, uh, it moves leftward uh, iteratively, feeding the network for uh, parameter tunings. Uh, tuning uh, and starting, of course, from an initial configuration uh, obtained by an offline pre training, uh, also uh, um, carried out at full resolution. At each iteration, the output is then processed, processed uh, by the two consistency loss terms. Uh, when the tuning uh, converges or reaches a prefixed number of uh, iterations, the training uh, is the fine tuning is uh, stopped. Then, uh, as the loss curves are not guaranteed to be monotonic, uh, we can take the parameters, uh, we can call them phi infinite, for example, that achieved the best uh, loss during the tuning and use them for the last network run that will, pro that will provide the wanted fan sharpening. Okay, now we can give a look to the specific loss uh, terms that we have used for consistency check. The spectral term compares the reduced resolution version uh, of the pan sharpened image with the input MS. This comparison is done using an L1 norm. Other norms or error measurements could be applied, of course. Uh, more complicated is the spatial consistency check. In this case, we had to choose what is a good uh, spatial quality uh, measure, uh, which is uh, a controversial point. Uh, actually, we, we believe that a good criterion uh, is the maximization of the local correlation coefficient between the pan sharpened band uh, and the pan component. So we have encoded uh, this concept uh, in, in our loss uh, that we call a correlation distortion, which is the complement of the local correlation coefficient averaged along the spectral and the spatial dimensions. In addition, we have added a sort of uh, saturation level. Uh, see the mean operator here in, in, in the square bracket. Uh, to this uh, saturation level was put to not push too up, uh, to not push up too much the, the correlation. Uh, otherwise, uh, we could uh, overemphasize cer certain image textures. The saturation value actually is itself uh, spatially and spectrally variant and is computed by correlating the resized MS image with the blurred version of the PAN image. Uh, well, it is a bit complicated, but it seems to work. Um, pretty well. Okay, so um, these are just two more references uh, of related works, just to show that uh, other people are going in the same uh, direction. Uh, you can certainly find other papers on the same research lane, uh, as this seems to be the most promising uh, direction at the moment. At least this is uh, my opinion. Uh, that's um, um, mostly different from our Zeta PNN uh, proposal, uh, 
for a different choice of the consist consistency losses and also they do not leverage on target uh, adaptation. Um, there are also differences for what concern uh, the, the architecture uh, of, of the CNN uh, that are employed, but this is a, a minor uh, aspect. Uh, okay, so um, to conclude, we, we give a look to the performance of our uh, proposed uh, Zoom, let's say Zoom for short, uh, approach. Um, to start, we, we have a picket uh, tree, as I said, uh, pan sharpening networks uh, that were that were um, were already proposed in the reduced resolution uh, training framework. And these are well known in our APNN, PANNET, and the RPNN. Uh, these are nested in, in our proposed full resolution training. Uh, framework, including the adaptation phase. And so we have uh, here three uh, variants uh, per uh, model. Uh, the original uh, version, uh, trained by the authors of the models at the reduced resolution, uh, so in a uh, native configuration, uh, and they are shown in light gray in these uh, in this bar plots. Uh, and are marked as pre-trained. Uh, and two target adaptive versions, uh, one using the reduced resolution uh, protocol uh, shown in a dark gray, and the other performing the tuning at full resolution as shown, uh, and are shown with blue bars. The four plots are associated to four different spectral consistency indicators. Uh, one is the popular uh, CAN index. The other three are reprojection uh, indicators. Uh, the pan sharpen image is downgraded and then compared to the MS uh, image using a standard index such as SAM, ERGAS, etc. Well, anyhow, in essence, these plots give two clear indications. First, the target adaptation is always effective regardless of the CNN models that we are using. And even if we use it at a reduced resolution and as in the original paper, uh, or if we use it also, if we use it in the full resolution uh, framework according to the proposed uh, Zoom uh, approach. So, um, you can see that the performance uh, basically uh, improve uh, from one uh, op configuration to the to the other. So the the tuning uh, at reduced resolution improves performance, and also the full resolution tuning uh, improves further our um, results. This, that was on, on spectral accuracy. We, has, we also have to look at the spatial uh, consistency. And if we look at the spatial consistency, here we use two uh, correlation, uh, two indicators of distortion. One is DS and the other is D-Roll. We have introduced both of them uh, previously. And here is expected, uh, there are results that are a bit more controversial as the same definition, defi definition of spatial consistency uh, presents, uh, as I discussed above, ambiguities. Uh, our full resolution adaptation scheme gets the best correlation distortion. And this is as, as expected because uh, we use the same, basically something that is very similar to the same indicator um, as a loss term. But on the other hand, we uh, we observe that this is, this is in contrast with the indication of DS. So there's two indicators seems to, to fight a little bit with, uh, with each other. Yeah, for a more comprehensive evaluation, it helps to give uh, a look to, this, to some simple results. Here, uh, we show the results obtained on a sample world view tree, uh, tree image. Uh, we have extracted some small, uh, meaningful crops to simplify the visual inspection. 
The results of the first row were obtained using APNN as a basic model. In the second row, we use PANNET as a basic uh, architecture. As these images clearly show, the zoom versions outperform the other options in terms of spatial quality. Structures and textures visible in the PAN component are pretty well transferred to the pan sharpened image using the zoom configuration, while uh, spatial artifacts and blurring effect effects uh, are present in the compared uh, options. Here we compare different uh, configurations of Zeta PNN, uh, that is uh, shown with blue bars, with the state of the art methods, uh, component substitution, uh, multi resolution methods, variational or other machine learning approaches. In this case, the pre training of our model uh, is also um, carried out at full resolution. So uh, we have always, uh, in, for the blue bars, models that are trained at a full resolution from, from, uh, from the beginning. Uh, with uh, here we have, um, of course, used our consistency uh, losses that I have shown you before, and the three options that we compare uh, correspond to no adaptation phase, uh, hundred iteration uh, adaptation, and uh, two thousand adaptation iterations. Again, the adaptation phase shows an impact on accuracy with a competitive overall uh, performance. Finally, moving to the visual inspection, we can further appreciate the performance of Zeta PNN. Uh, these, crops, uh, these are crops uh, from a single world view tree image of Adelaide. Uh, together with Zoom PNN, we have selected uh, the best competitors according to DS and DRAW for spatial accuracy assessment and also with respect to the lambda for spectral uh, distortion. From the spatial perspective, the Zeta PNN results are pretty nice, uh, letting us to appreciate fine structures and texture. The spectral quality uh, trivially speaking, the color quality is also quite satisfied with, with no noticeable aberrations. Um, indeed, there is little loss on, on the spectral side. Um, as you can see, the, the color is, uh, is a bit um, brighter on our uh, Zeta PNN with respect to the multispectral uh, input image. Just as far the confirmation we have experienced also with uh, WorldView 2 and GeoEye images, and here is just an, another example in this case for WorldView 2 image uh, images, and basically uh, these results uh, confirm that we are uh, we have observed uh, what we have observed for WorldView 3 images. So the same old old also for GeoEye. Uh, images that we don't show, uh, we do not show here for uh, for brevity, and uh, and well, with this this concludes my talk, and uh, uh, I I can finally uh, thank you very much again for attending this class, and and read for uh, for your questions now before having a break of cards and leave the desk to to Matteo. Okay, we have uh, an. Uh, question the network is trained on one and two scales why the inference okay first i have to go back to slide 59 okay Yeah, the, 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 the question is about uh, the training uh, 
performed on um, reduced resolution scale the scheme on the on the left and um, the student uh, is asking uh, if uh, it is a problem that the network learns on one scale and then infer on another scale uh yeah there is this is what i think i i, I think uh the problem is not a technical problem it's, it's, you can do this uh but the experience that you have th that network will uh, will have uh training on a reduced scale uh, is a different experience you know, because you you see different images that are uh more blurred with respect to the real image that you have at at, uh, at inference time. Uh, I don't know if the question is about this notation that can be a, a bit misleading because uh, the index zero and one and one and two refer to the uh, actual uh, resolution on uh, of the pixels. So. Uh, P0 and M1 is uh, is a is the same uh, is the the couple of image that we have in the reduced in the sorry in the full resolution domain in the full resolution domain the scale of uh, of the panchromatic image is for example for world view uh, image you have uh, 31 um, centimeters okay for the pan but uh, the corresponding MS has 1.24 meters of uh, resolution. So, of course, you also make a resides that is not shown here. There is an interpolation that you have to operate on M1 to, uh, to make it uh, of, of the same size of P0, of course. So I don't know if uh, I have answered to uh, to to your question. Uh, yeah, the question put it simple was uh, I will, my first interpretation was correct. So how can a reduced resolution uh, network trained on resolu reduced resolution uh, data? Uh, generalize properly uh, on full resolution images. Uh, yeah, I think there is some uh, gap that you that you will have. For this reason, the current trend, uh, and we also we are following this trend, is to make the training of full resolution uh, data. Uh, of course, many people. Uh, when making, when assessing the performance of uh, their own network, uh, make the assessment on reduced resolution data, and they go, uh, they they have very good results sometimes, but the the results are good on reduced resolution data. So. Uh, it is a good thing, but uh, we don't know how the network really uh, perform on uh, on full resolution on real data that are that have a higher resolution. So uh, when you read the paper on, on pan sharpening uh, in the in the assessment section, uh, you have uh, usually two uh, two parts. One uh, where you have a reference based indexes, SAM, ergas, etc. And there you are assessing necessarily your technique on reduced on simulated data. So the, there you can assess objectively your uh, performance, but on simulated data. If you want to compare to algorithm on real data, and then you have to resort uh, to uh, consistency indexes like DS, D lambda, or D rot that we have introduced. Okay, so, but that is an open an open issue. Uh, so, um, especially for the spatial point of view. 
Okay, so uh, um, there are other questions. How to select the training patch sites to preserve edges and boundaries? Um, well, when you do training, um, you know in advance uh, the size, you know, the, 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 the border effect, which is the, the size that you have to uh, uh, consider. And in, at, in, at training time, when you compute the loss, you have to exclude this uh, frame from the, uh, the average. When you apply the L2 norm, for example, you make differences among uh, input and output images, the small patches, but you have to ignore uh, the, 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 the frame of your difference image and the size of this uh this frame box depends on the uh, number of convolution and depends on the on the on the kernel sites okay so usually each convolution contributes uh to these uh these um, sites uh with half of these uh kernel size. So if uh, the convolution is five by five, uh, the, the border effect is two pixel wide, which means five minus one divided by two. There is a uh, well uh, known formula to compute the extent of the uh, border effect. So you have to accumulate these uh, values for each convolution that you have in your networks. So uh, the, the, mean, the mean size of the patch uh, must be such that you, you, you have something after removing uh, the, the, the frame. After removing the frame, you need to have again a part of a useful part of the, of the output image that allows you to compute the loss. There is, of course, uh, a loss uh, data loss somehow you, you have to account so better not to choose a too small patch otherwise this overhead of uh, um, of uh, data that you have to discard uh, is to becomes dominant so uh, but usually uh, as I indicated above um, you can have uh, like, um, you know, patches of 100 by 100 could be a reasonable size, even smaller one. And when you have uh, a useful, uh, you know, a, a patch, let's say 100 by 100, this kind of size is enough to account for uh, spatial interactions uh that determine sharpness or spatial features so usually uh, the spatial uh, features that you want to reconstruct um, do not have uh, you know a wide spatial extension so uh in my experience uh, it does not help to consider um uh, patch too large because you are thinking that there is some spatial interaction that allows you to improve the, the sharpness of the features that you are going to extract. So there is some la large scale interaction, but long scale interaction, but they are so very um, negligible with respect to what is happening locally in, 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 a, in, a, in a range of uh, like, tens of pixels around uh, each uh, location, okay? I don't know if this uh, responds to the uh, your questions on, on boundaries and... Okay. Are there other questions? Well, if not, uh, I thank you again very much for to be patient to listen to me for a couple of hours. Uh, 
uh, I hope that uh, you know you found this uh, talk useful for uh, for your research uh, path or more in general for your scientific background and uh, um, well so I, I I leave you uh, into the hand of Matteo that will uh, uh, will uh, will present the second part of the this talk but of course you need a uh, you need a break so uh, I think 10 minutes uh, will out will be enough so uh, you can come back in 10 minutes around about uh, 12 uh, 30 uh, at least in Italy uh, this is the time so at 30 okay um thank you for uh, for appreciating my presentation so um see you uh, next time i hope to to see some of you maybe physically somewhere in some congress why not in the next igers at pasadena it will be a pleasure to to meet uh, each of you so um have a nice day uh, a nice continuation of your school
Okay, can we restart? Yes, I think you can go, Matteo. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so before we start, I would like to reintroduce myself again. I am Matteo Ciotola, as you perfectly know, from the University of Naples, Federico II, and I'm a member of the Greek research team as Professor Scarpa. And I'm glad to be here today. This is the first time I am on the other side of the desk. So I'm a little bit excited. I apologize for that. Nevertheless, I will do my best to give you helpful and precise information. And don't be afraid to interrupt me during the presentation. I have the chat on my screen. So if you want to ask questions, you are free uh, for that. Okay, uh, in what's left of the lesson, we will discuss about data manipulation and deep learning algorithms for solving the punch sharpening problem. And first of all, I hope that uh, all the notices were effective and forced you to sing in into the Kaggle platform because all these exercises we will see today are on this website. If you haven't got uh, an account of, or if you haven't activated your GPU, please do it now. There are some slides uh, um, on the cloud that um, you can follow as guide for doing, for, for doing it. And um, uh, while I will test a few minutes speaking about some general info. Okay, so uh, to have a broad overview of the most uncommon data formats using the remote sensing, we must distinguish the differences between uh, satellite sensors. A satellite may acquire uh, different, kind, different kinds of information, such as, um, for example, uh, vis visible light, radio waves, altimetry, and so on. And uh, uh, for each type of this data, um, we can use a particular extension for, um, uh, for the encoding. For example, regarding uh, optical imagery, which is the information used in, in this practice part, um, there are many common data formats, and some of uh, these are HDF-EOS, that means hierarchical data format for Earth observing system, it is a self-describing data format, and it is the standard data format for all NASA Earth Observing System data products. Um, in particular, HDF is a format that supports a huge variety of types of data. You can encode, for example, raster, images, uh, and dimensional matrices, tables, metadata, and whatever you want. Uh, another type of extension is uh, uh, the geography markup language for JPEG 2000. Um, JPEG 2000 is a wavelet-based image compression standard. And with the addition of JML, we have the, the, the possibility to include some XML data for the description of our image file. And finally, uh, I would like to stress on GeoTIFF, that is one of the most famous and most used um, format for uh, remote sensing imagery. Uh, as uh, JML JPEG 2000, GeoTIFF is a, an extension of the regular TIFF format, which uses a small set of reserved TIFF tags to store uh, um, georeferencing information. Okay, so uh, the time for uh, singing, singing in, in Kaggle is. Uh, uh, ended. So uh, let's go to our first exercises. You can go to the Kaggle, log in, and uh, in the search bar, you should write IADFX1, and you will see the first uh, notebook. Okay, in this first exercise, this first guided exercise, we will crop a big image to create some of the needed patches with which uh, uh, train and test a, a convolutional neural, neural network. Uh, for this purpose, we will use this library called JDAL. JDAL 
uh, means your special data abstraction library. This library is a, an open source library for reading and writing several geographic data formats. And as the name suggests, it presents a common, a common abstract data model to which the application can interact with the uh, remote sensing images and vectors. Okay. Uh, as Professor Scarpa said before, um, we will exploit the two different kinds of, of data, the panchromatic image and the multispectral stack. They differ in information it provides. Panchromatic image is a richer spatial resolution, but the lower spectral definition, the multispectral bands. Our final goal um, will be to construct an algorithm capable of generating a stack of band that has both the quality of the pen and the MS stack. In this, uh, in this first little part of the lesson, I will focus on uh, uh, only on the first of those, but in a few minutes, uh, both will be the main character of our lecture. Okay, so once you open the file with this command, you can interact directly with the abstract model extrapolating many metadata. For example, you can get some uh, basic information about the image, or uh, more important, you can get the all the georeference system of the picture. Uh, this system uh, help us to map each pixel of our uh, raster to the globe, to the world. And so we can geolocate uh, efficacy uh, the image on, um, on the correct scene. Uh, we can also have some information about uh, the, uh, the, the magnitude of the pixel, both for width and height. And finally, we can have some information about the dimensions. In this case, we have a, um, a picture of 2048 times 2048 times one, because one is the bands that compose the, uh, the panchromatic uh, image. Okay, and finally, you can access directly to the image converting it into an n-dimensional matrix or for Python users into an ampi matrix, in an ampi array. Uh, you can have also a preview of the image here directly in the notebook. Okay, so JDAL allows uh, really, really uh, multiple kinds of manipulation of our image. Uh, it allows conversions, it allows many things. But returning to the goal of our exercise, we need to produce some patches starting from this big tile and the link in the multispectral stack. And iterating this process on multiple images, it is possible to compose a in quite well data set. Okay, so let's uh, give to the, our code the pets of uh, the panchromatic and the multispectral images and let's, uh, let's open them and uh, Let's check if that we have chosen the right images, making some mathematical controls about particular ratio, and uh, also uh, recently inspecting them. Okay, they are correct, everything is fine. And um, in general, uh, after the conversion of an entire, of an entire um, raster into an array, we can view it as a really, really big matrix that can be easily split. This is the matrix. And uh, we can easily split this matrix into um, different sub matrices uh, representing the patches. We have two ways to do uh, this stuff. We can uh, um, firstly uh, convert the image into an ampere array and then cut the, the desired patch or we can do it directly into the read as array function. Uh, in, both case, in both cases, we must respect the spectral constraints. Uh, be careful about uh, the axis because um, they have different meanings referring to images and uh, um, arrays. They are inverted. And in both cases, we must respect the special constraints. We cannot give the, index, the indexes used for panchromatic 
to the multispectral one because it is smaller of a factor equal to the ratio. Uh, we must keep this in mind because it is a really common error. However, passing through the Rita's array function, the loss, the special references of the of our images will be lost because the NumPy array uh, does not maintain the, the spectral details and it is uh, annoying. So we have implemented a, um, a new function called Patchify, which uh, you can see here, that solves this, this problem that allows us um, to save the patch correctly georeferenced. Uh, we use always the matrix annotation to cut the desired patch. We, uh, read, uh, we convert the, the patch into array and we cut it normally. But we make also the calculation of the new origins and set correctly the fields needed for the geolocalizations into our GeoTIF file. Okay. Uh, now, we may already be ready to use these files for our goals because Python allow, allows us uh, to convert them into an MP array on which apply calculation and manipulations. Anyway, in my opinion, it is better to achieve a step further, converting them into MAT files. And uh, uh, this choice has two main advantages. Uh, it allows a faster compliance with MATLAB. Um, one sharpening problem is still partially solved by algorithms developed in MATLAB. And for this region, many useful tools are still written in MATLAB, especially for evaluation. And the other advantage is that a single MAT file can contain multiple kinds of information, such as images with different dimensions and number of bands. And we can encode singular or multiple couples of panchromatic and multispectral images with much other useful information in a single file with a little a really small overhead. Uh, for, for, for example, in this case, we have decided, decided to include uh, info about the name of the satellite, the, uh, the spectral uh, range, the number of bits that encodes our information, and um, a, 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 the, pos the, the possible usage of the, pack, of the page. Uh, um, the sixth uh, patch could be used for validation, the tenth for test, and the other for training, for example. Um, okay, now we face the last hurdle because deep learning should be trained in a strict definition in a supervised manner. And even the algorithm that we will see later, APNN, has a supervised training framework. But Professor Scarpa suggested to you. Um, the satellite does not provide a ground route for the loss calculation. Uh, a solution to this problem is downsampling the available data. And this function re called resize images uh, provides some different alternatives for uh, doing uh, this thing. The first and simplest one is downsampling the data to a bipubic interpolator. I do not recommend it because uh, it may introduce some spectral aberrations uh, into uh, our downgraded, ver downgraded version of our images. Uh, a better solution could be a low pass filtering plus a designation to the nearest neighbor interpolator. Uh, the low pass filter should match the modulation transfer function as much as possible. So, it is quite simple to generate a, modulation transfer, a simulated modulation transfer function because if we know the satellites that acquired our uh, tiles, we can uh, select the gains of our uh, Nyquist frequencies for each band. They are known. And uh, we can, uh, with these frequencies, we can create a stack of Gaussian and with this Gaussian, we can have the low pass filter version of our image uh, do, by, uh, by doing a convolution. After all these uh, procedures, we can um, decimate 
this uh, uh, image uh, thanks to a nearest neighbor interpolator. This we can, we can do the, this, uh, um, this passage for the multispectral, but also for the panchromatic. Okay. Uh, now, so essentially, uh, we are ready to pass to, uh, to deep learning. So let me show you the second guided exercise writing in the search bar IADF X2. This one. Okay. This exercise refers to developing a deep learning technique, the APN method for solving the punch sharpening problem. Uh, in this part of the lesson, we will see the main instruments that we have to develop to train a neural network and to test it. But I would like to stress on a really, really important thing that is that deep learning algorithms are not even for, uh, not even methods, or rather CNNs are models estimated by data through an optimization algorithm. So the first important step for developing a CNN, a CNN capable of achieving the efficacy of the goal is to organize and process hundred and hundred or thousand of the, of the samples. And it could be a nightmare, but the, the library the, that we will see today, PyTorch, provides two classes to make easier the entire process and entire pipeline. These two classes are data set and data loader. The data set object focuses on storing or generating samples and their corresponding labels, while data loader wraps an iterable around the, around the data set to enable easy access to multiple samples. And these classes, in particular, the first one, the data set, can be inherited to be customized for our interest. In particular, to create a custom data set class, we must implement three functions. A constructor in which we can uh, declare all the variables that we need, a function that returns the dimension of the, of the data set, the number of samples of our data set, and finally, the get titan functions. Uh, this function is the most important and uh, it must return all the data that we need for training or testing our architecture. In this case, being a, this class for training purpose, we need a single couple composed of samples and labels. And uh, uh, in this case, the input has been modeled as a unique stack composed of the multispectral uh, stack interpolated to the same scale of the pen and the pen. Why the ground fruit is the uh, original multispectral band. Okay, a little tip for you. Uh, if you have enough space on your hard disk drive, try to implement all these calculations offline. Indeed, the training um, a neural network uh, uh, is already computational and time expensive, and some manipulation may even slow down the entire process. In particular, the interpolator could be um, not computational um, efficient. So uh, I have uh, uh, tried to implement this solution offline, adding a new field in my math file called the IE and uh, comparing the two uh, versions of uh, data set, we can see that the second solution is uh, uh, faster, really, really faster, more faster than the, the first one. So we will use the second one. Okay. Once the data has been implemented, we can pass to, 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 to the, the data loader, sorry. Um, we have said before that data set retrieves, uh, retrieves our images and ground truth one piece at a time, but while we are training a, a model, we typically want to pass samples in mini batches, reshuffling data at every epoch to reduce uh, the model overfitting, uh, we will do, uh, we want to do all these in a really, really fast way. And uh, data loader is uh, uh, the perfect tool for us because it creates an iterable that abstracts uh, all the complexity in a straightforward API. So implement a data loader is really, is really simple. 
we uh, only must to uh, give it to it uh, the, the data set, the number of samples that compose the single batch, if and if we want or not shuffle the data at the end of the epoch. This is all the required uh, fields. Okay, now the most important thing in the data is uh, ready for use, and we can focus on the next stack, such as architecture and losses. Let's go to the architecture. Uh, we have seen in the previous part of the lesson only feed forward, feed forward the neural network that basis is training on back propagation, which computes the gradient of the loss function concerning the network, week, the network weeks for a single input output example. And this calculation consists of two steps, the forward and the backward. Uh, PyTorch helps at the time us through uh, giving to us the NN package. In this package is contained the NN module that is a particular module, a particular class. It receives an input tensor that is a special variable for PyTorch and returns a tensor in output. But this module may also hold internal states such as matrices containing the double parameters. And even if the APN network is still a simple architecture, it may, it may be defined as a custom NN module uh, class, establishing not only the elements that compose the layout in the constructor, but also defining the forward function. And this function is important to know how these elements are linked each other. And it is important because it is important because it computes the forward step of our backpropagation method. And in this case, the network is based on three convolutional layers followed by a um, summing node. Uh, between the two convolutional layers, a relu activation is exploited. And as Professor Scarpa said before, by design choice, only the valid part of the image will be propagated through the network. And for this reason, we have to implement a scope variable um, with which cut away the edges of the input for, the for, the, for respecting the correct dimension of our tensors. Okay, so once they find the network and check it that everything works well, uh, we can choose with the which loss function and with which optimizer we want to treat the weights of our net or our model. In this case, we have chosen the an L1 loss, but there are many others such as the uh, mean square error. For example, I suggest to use it in the in the practical part of this lesson. And uh, so we are ready to train the network, and we can write a train uh, function. Uh, so um, this function consists of two nested loops. The outer counts the epochs, uh, while the inner, the inner scrolls the batches until all the examples of the data sets have been used to feed the network uh, during the training. Um, we can enclose the backpropagation protocol in these few lines of code. First, uh, first of all, the gradients are uh, set to zero, and then the feed uh, the uh, forward step uh, is uh, achieved, uh, feeding the network with the inputs and obtaining the outputs that will be uh, compared with the ground truth to the loss function. And with this uh, um, uh, scalar value, loss function is a scalar value, we can uh, calculate the gradients of uh, each weight of our uh, each. Of, we can compute the gradients of the weights of the each layer of our network, uh, thanks to the chain rule, and update uh, the weights of the network. And uh, iterating this process for the entire set of data and for n times. We could converge in, if everything works well and we correctly set the hyperparameters to, the, to an optimal optimum value. Okay. Uh, 
I have also written a second version of the function that is, that is a little bit more complicated, but substantially the core is the same. In this case, I have tried to create a function more similar to the fit method of TensorFlow, giving you a prettier representation of the training with the bars, uh, the increasing bars and colors and so on. Man, don't care about them. Okay, so finally, after all this hard work made, for, made by us and um, by GPU, uh, we can uh, explore the trends of the losses, in particular, the train loss and the validation loss. And uh, most important, we can conduct experiments and reap the rewards. We have carried out two different kinds of steps as uh, uh, many, many uh, papers uh, do in, uh, in, in, the, in their uh, purposes, in, 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 the, in their experimental section. Uh, we have conducted the experiment at reduced resolution and at full resolution. At the reduced resolution, we exploit some of the matrices uh, defined in the theoretical part as uh, air gas, SEM, and uh, cool to N, while at the full resolution, we will visually inspect the results. And uh, uh, in this test, you can see factually uh, what Professor Scarpa said before about the correct split of the data. Uh, indeed, if we take a picture, as the, this one that is Mexico, Mexico City, that is a, a site that we have used also for training. Uh, um, anyway, this picture it was never used for training. It is from the same scene, but it is another patch. Uh, we can see that the, the behavior of our network is a uh, real good. The matrices are fit, are good. Ergas and Sam have, a really low value, while q n is uh, uh, pretty high. Uh, while uh, visually inspecting the, result, the results at full resolution, we can see that the, uh, the methods works fine. Uh, but moving on on another patch or, or another site that uh, uh, we never seen before, uh, everything changes. Uh, in particular, uh, it is possible to evidence a lack of generalization capability by, the, by our solution. Uh, in the first patch, everything works fine. But in this one, metrics are really high. We have a ergas value uh, around 10, same around five, a foot one, foot one, <coughs> sorry, please. Uh, quite low, but also with respecting the results, you can see that there are some aberration, but some artifacts, especially in, uh, on the, some details, especially on the roof, on the top right, and also in the bottom. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. But why this behavior emerge? It depends on several factors. One is uh, surely the depth of our architecture. Uh, another aspect could be the hyperparameter used, and in this case, we have set them randomly. And finally, it could be also a data set problem. Uh, we can overcome this issue uh, using a deeper network. But uh, uh, for, for this reason, we need more data and the data costs a lot of money, or we can exploit the target adaptive modality introduced before. Uh, this framework consists of fitting the weights of the network on the, on the new test data. And by doing so, the outcomes hopefully will be more precise and consistent. Uh, this modality is uh, um, stressed in the third exercise. Okay, so uh, 
you target at substantially, you target at uptick is a, a fine tuning of the network on the downscaled version of the target image for a fixed number of epochs before producing the outcomes. The only thing that I have edited uh, is in respect to the previous code is the training loop, because now we have a single four cycle due to the lack of a proper training set, but everything is substantially the same um, as the code seen before. And now uh, going really, really fast to, um, um, to the test part, uh, we can see, we can easily inspect the results and compare the results obtained with the, the APN and method with the, the the, the other obtained by APNN with target adaptive modality. And in this case, we can see a significant improvement, especially in the area, in the areas uh, with the small details, as we have seen before, uh, like in, the, in this uh, roof or also in this part of the image. So target adaptive modality could be really, really useful for us. Okay, so I have uh, given to you a really, really fast overview about the data manipulation and deep learning algorithms for punch sharpening. And uh, we can uh, now have a little break. After this break, it is your turn and you will have uh, some exercises that I will explain uh, later. So uh, good break. Let's see you later.
Okay. Is there any question about the codes, about what I have explained the, since now? Matteo, just to inform you about time, we have other 45 yeah. minutes just to finish five minutes before to create a break between the two lessons. And so that's all. Okay, let's see. so let's pass to the practical part. So, just a note for the audience, please don't be shy. We have this opportunity to ask questions uh, to professors. So this is a great opportunity with respect to the others that are following the, um, the lessons outside the Zoom class. So please, if you have any question, don't be shy, try to interact with the professors because this is the main difference between you and the rest of people that are following the live streaming uh, outside Zoom class or they will see the recorded video. So you can go ahead. Okay. Still no questions. So, okay, now it is your turn. In this fourth notebook, you will find some small exercises. The first two are guided. You only have to uh, fill in these parts of code and run the uh, run the notebook. Uh, in the, the first exercise consists consists of making uh, a and a deeper version of APNN to try to improve its generalization capability. Why in the second, you should reflect on the importance of the hyperparameters and how different values, for example, of the learning, of the learning, learning rate uh, may affect the entire team procedure. And finally, if you have enough time, please try to implement your own deep learning architecture uh, with which have better outcomes than APNN, hopefully. So you cannot find exercise four. Okay. Uh, have you, uh, it is a public notebook. Perfect, thank you. I was, uh, If you have any question about the exercises. Ah, oh, fantastic. I don't know why. It may be a Kaggle problem. Thank you, Jason, for the link. And if you have a sound up about the exercise, I'm here for you for the rest of the lesson. So. Good work and uh, uh, have a nice continue with the other professors. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and for your time. I hope that everything was clear and thank you so much. Uh, see you in some uh, events such as uh, IGARS the next year or uh, on, you can send me also an email if you want, if you want to ask me um, other things. I'm free uh, for, for you. I'm available to answer to everything. Thank you so much. Good work.
Actually, can I uh, can I ask a quick question, not uh, directly related to the code, but uh, indirectly? Yes. As, uh, so, good morning. My, my name is Jason, and um, hi, Jason. I've noticed. <laughs> how you doing? We've uh, we've been using uh, Google Collab Notebooks uh, for the last most presentations, and I was wondering uh, why you guys chose Kaggle. Uh, do you like it more for any specific reason, or is it just? Uh, um, yeah, for us, for um, for me, it's the same. Uh, I have some. I have had some students that uh, were more uh, uh, more more happy to use Kaggle because maybe for for uh, its name because Kaggle organizes a lot of competitions, a lot of things, and so if you have a a good um, account on on Kaggle, you can uh, spend it also in 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 a work in. A, in, in your curriculum. So for me, it was the same. I have, um, I have tried also to implement these uh, notebook on um, Google uh, notebooks. And uh, I have also a version on, uh, on local, on my local PC with uh, Visual Studio. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, in this case for the, data sets and uh, uh, for uh, the notebooks. Uh, the real advantage to use Kaggle is the possibility to, to don't uh, um, occupy your memory or your the Google Drive memory, but you, sh you store all the data on another service. And uh, I think for you, it's better. Maybe, I don't know. Oh, that makes sense. Awesome, thank you. I think you're welcome.
Okay, we have uh, uh, under 20 minutes, I think. Mm. Are there questions, issues about the code? Everything is fine, it's fine for you. Have you implemented the, the first exercise? Someone will share his uh, screen and for, 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 uh, for with an inspecting the outcomes. Everything is fine. Okay, I uh, would like to share with you the first, the solution of the first exercise. Finally, uh, you to copy and past uh, this line of code, uh, changing the features, and the kernel size here and running this uh, uh, part of code, you, well, it was also the, the training function. I don't remember it. Okay. And see also um, so, some info about the losses. In this case, uh, the losses, uh, have still a good slope, so we can we could uh, uh, continue our training for um, 
uh, other epochs, I think also for uh, 50 more epochs. Uh, and you can see that the, the, the validation loss is uh, still uh, lower than the training loss. So uh, we have uh, a room uh, for, for, for improving and for increasing our results. But going to uh, the test, we have a, a, a really small values about air gas and SAM, a, a quite higher value about uh, this, other, this other metric put when, and we are expecting, uh, no, there is not, we are expecting result, the results, but you, could add uh, the, the sale of gold and see what happened. Um, so it is the first uh, exercise. While the second, I will give you some other information about the second now. No, okay, now. About the second, uh, I uh, always set randomly this value, these values. So uh, I cannot uh, say to you what are the uh, correct uh, value to reach the optimum. Um, I think that some values such as uh, there is no a correct value for an, an hyperparameter because the hyper, we can achieve the same result with different ways. We can try to have a higher rate and we can achieve the optimum, the optimum in a fewer epochs, or we can try to um, decrease the rate and uh, increase the time to get the our model ready for use. Um, I prefer the second choice because uh, uh, setting a really smooth rate could help us with the uh, unstable uh, losses. For example, in the Zeta PNN code. Okay, we have a, a when you young that uh, pass to us some uh, of. Uh, um, of the outcomes that uh, he had uh, calculated. Uh, th these outcomes uh, um, refers to the to uh, your uh, deep learning area, um, your deep learning technique, or uh, are about the first uh, exercise. When you x one, okay, perfect. So. It is normal, it is normal to have these values, but um, the, there are some uh, tricks that uh, will give you a better solution. For example, you, you may uh, in, in implement a, a best way, um, a best model uh, uh, say. So if you make the training, um, you can uh, you can monitor the the train loss or the validation loss, and if you get a lower value, you can save the train the the network weights and use these uh, weights for uh, uh, for tests. So it is an exchemotage uh, with which uh, obtain uh, better results. There are many others, such as if you uh, run into a plateau, if your loss uh, doesn't uh, go down anymore, uh, you can reduce automatically the linear rate uh, trying to uh, reach a, a, a smaller value. There are many, many tools uh, to solve the overfitting problem to solve these uh, plateau problems. Thank you so much, Venue, for, for, for this uh, information. Um, okay, I will give you uh, some 
other time, some few minutes, and then we will finish the lesson. See you later. Okay, anyone else wants to share his results with us?
Okay. Uh, so, um, as I said before about the second exercise, you have uh, uh, you can um, ch choose many many different values that uh, uh, could be optimum for you, but not optimum for uh, another one. Uh, there is no a uh, guide for training. Uh, it is um, still an artisan uh, part of uh, deep learning solutions uh, where you can customize your training on your own uh, constraints and your uh, goals. Uh, about the third exercise, uh, a suggestion that I want to give to you is to relieve, to the, skip connections about, um, for example, PANNET is a, a, a good, um, a really good performance also for the, the use of back, uh, of skip connections of the um, receiver blocks. Uh, because uh, in this way, the information will be propagated to the network, even if the network is uh, uh, really deep. Um, okay, I think I think that uh, time is over. Uh, maybe Mr. Dr. Vivone could uh, uh, give me a feedback about the time. We can, can we? Uh, yeah, I think you have other five minutes if uh, you want. No, no, okay. we can finish earlier if you prefer. Okay, okay I think we can finish here with this lesson. Thank you so much, Professor Scarpa and Dr. Ciotola, for this interesting lesson about fast sharpening. Thank I you. The organization of a two-hour lecture for uh, by a two-hour hands-on part is not so easy, I can guess, but you did it in the proper way. I think that uh, the, the theory, in my opinion, the theory is uh, fundamental, but even to pass from theory to practice is uh, important as well. So in, we are trying to do this with uh, our school and uh, you, you did it in the proper way. On behalf of our technical committee, I'd like to thank you once more for your effort in producing the material and for providing this lesson. And uh, I think now it's time to have a small break, 10 minutes, even some minutes more, before the starting of the next lesson about XAI, thanks to the contribution of Dr. Ronco from the University of Valencia. So see you in a few minutes. <laughs>